Hi, and welcome to Crash Course Catholicism, a podcast about Catholic teaching and why it makes sense. I'm your host, Caitlin West. Alrighty, welcome to part one of our two-parter on the Catholic Church. Okay, now you might be thinking, hang on a second, we are up to like what, episode 14 of this podcast. How come it takes the catechism of the Catholic Church so long to actually start talking about the Catholic Church, right? Like in some ways it seems a little bit odd to be starting so late in the piece. Okay, the catechism actually helpfully explains to us why this is the case. Okay, so points number 748 and 749 tell us that We need to start by talking about the fundamentals of our faith, right? About Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and the life, death and resurrection of Christ. We need to talk about those things first before we even begin to talk about the Catholic Church. Why? Because the Catholic Church arises out of and is entirely dependent on those things. So point number 748 reads that the church has no other light than Christ's. It is like the moon. All its light is reflected from the sun. Okay. So in other words, it's not like, you know, a couple of thousand years ago, a bunch of people got together and they were sort of like, okay, I think that we should establish a religion. So let's decide on some things we agree on. We'll put together some doctrines and we'll elect a leader. I mean, that's kind of almost how it's represented sometimes, especially by atheists. They'll say like, oh, you know, the the church was just an invention of human beings. That's actually not how the church unfolded historically. And it's also not how the church works today. And that's really important. The job of the church isn't to just make up teachings, right? It's literally there solely to reflect and to pass on and safeguard a set of pre-existing truths. Okay, the church was established by Jesus and then from then on, everything that he taught and revealed has been handed on by the apostles and their successors until now. Okay, so before we go any further, we're already starting to use the word church, right? But we haven't yet exactly defined what we mean by that. Okay, so what does it mean when I say the church? What is the church? Okay, so maybe for you, that word church conjures up images of literal churches, right? Buildings. Or you might think of, you know, St. Peter's Basilica. Or maybe you think of things like, you know, the catechism, yeah, sets of of doctrines and dogmas and rules and, and commandments that we have to follow. Now, all of those things are great and important, but the church is so much more than just a set of buildings or rules, right? So point number 751 of the catechism reads, the word church means a convocation or an assembly. God is calling together his people from all the ends of the earth. And then the Catholic Encyclopedia refers to the church as a society formed of living people. Okay, so you'll notice in both those quotes that what we're really talking about is people. Okay, people gathering together, being gathered together by Christ in order to know, love and worship him. Okay, so this is why in the Gospels, our Lord uses the image of a sheepfold, okay, and himself as the shepherd. Now, does this mean that if it's all just about people, right, does that mean that we don't really need the buildings and the dogmas and the hierarchy, etc.? No, absolutely not. Okay, those things are also essential. So it's like if you said, you know, oh, well, a school is basically just a community of students that all come together to learn. Okay, that's fantastic, but that doesn't mean that we no longer need a syllabus, yeah, or a building or teachers. Okay, that would be ridiculous because you need both. You need the students and you also need the stuff. So the Catholic Encyclopedia talks about how because the church is a society, like all other societies, it has rules. It has executive officers, officers as in people, not officers as in spaces. It has ceremonial observances, okay, things that we all do as Catholics. And this makes sense, right? Because any time ever that human beings come together with a common purpose, they need some kind of structure, yeah, some kind of 
leadership, a set of like an understanding of who we are, what we think and what our aim is together. Right. So this is also why our Lord uses the image of a building of which he is the cornerstone. Right. It's getting at this idea that we need something solid, something tangible, something structured and something grounded in him. OK, now, in one sense, that all might sound kind of clinical, right? The idea of institutional religion, rules and executive offices and ceremonial observances. Okay. And that makes a kind of sense, right? Because ultimately our faith as Christians is a personal relationship of love with a living God, right? So we can sort of think, well, if we're called to know and love God, then why do we need to have rules for that, right? So I remember when I was at uni and I had a friend who was explaining to me that she was actually raised Catholic, but one day she sort of realized when she was a teenager that she was following all of these rules and going to mass and saying all these prayers. But really what it boiled down to was just the golden rule, right? Which is love God and love your neighbor. And she was like, oh, I had that light bulb moment. And I was like, that's all that really matters. And so I just, you know, let go of all of that unnecessary extra stuff. And I just live now. I just live that golden rule. And <laughs> look, in one sense, she's she's right in the sense that as Christians, the one thing we're called to do is to love God and love our neighbor, right? That is essentially our calling as Christians. But that does not mean that we don't need the mass, that we don't need the doctrines and dogmas. And why is that? Well, for two reasons. First of all, what do you mean when you say love God, love your neighbor? Like, what does that actually, like, what does that entail? What does it mean to love others? What is the path of greatest love, you know, in any situation? How do we know what that is and how do we follow it? Okay. And this is a question that we're actually going to circle back to later in this episode. Okay. So just put a pin in it for now. But secondly, we're not just called to love God and to love our neighbor. We are called to radically love God and neighbor. We are called, in fact, to the perfection of love. Christ says, be perfect just as your heavenly father is perfect. So let's think about what it actually takes to become perfect in something, in anything, right? So I remember when I was a kid and my mom and dad had this copy of Vivaldi's Four Seasons on CD. And I got completely obsessed with it. I used to listen to it all the time. And I just fell in love with the sound of the violin, right? I just thought it was so beautiful. And I wanted to play music that had that kind of passion and emotion in it, right? So I begged and begged my parents and they eventually bought me a violin and let me start lessons. I was so excited, but oh my lordy may, I was so disappointed when I actually started the lessons. Because here I was, right, a six-year-old, completely ready to play Vivaldi, <laughs> and all my teacher would let me do is play these boring scales over and over. And there's so many rules about where your fingers have to go and how you have to hold the bow. And she was always standing over me saying, like, well, you didn't do that right, and you could do that better. And I just felt, you know, my, my six-year-old artistic soul felt so oppressed, right? I was like, I just want to pl play with wild abandon. Why do I have to follow all these rules? But over time, obviously, you know, I started to improve through this practice. And I remember the first time I actually started to enjoy the sound of my own playing it was when I was a teenager and I was playing something and I was like, whoa, this actually sounds nice. Like I, I'm enjoying listening to it. And eventually I did play Vivaldi. I was able to play it with, I mean, it wasn't exactly virtuosic, but I was able to play it with emotion and color and vibrancy precisely because I had learned all of those rules and done the scales and done those hours of boring musicianship, right? Now, let's consider a different example. So you might have heard of a woman called Florence Foster Jenkins. So there was a movie actually made about her quite recently starring Meryl Streep. Florence Foster Jenkins was an amateur opera singer from the 20th century, and she was absolutely renowned for being terrible okay like she could not sing on key to save her life but but she sang with great enthusiasm and great passion right she was like Algernon in the importance of being earnest I don't play accurately but I do play with wonderful expression so she had all the expression but she didn't know what she was doing there's this fantastic quote about her from a guy called Stephen Pyle and he says no one 
before or since, has succeeded in liberating themselves quite so completely from the shackles of musical notation. <laughs> I love that quote because it's like, yeah, exactly. Once you shed the dis- the restrictive shackles of rules and regulations, that's where you end up. You sound awful. So there's actually audio recordings of her singing that are available on YouTube. I'll put them in the show notes, but I recommend that you go and listen to them. And as you're listening, just think, this is what faith without rules sounds like, right? Chaos. It doesn't work. Okay, so you might be thinking, oh, yeah, Caitlin, I get it, sure. We need to follow rules. But aren't the rules just written on our hearts? You know, like, why do we need a church to tell me what's right and wrong? Surely I know what's right and wrong. And this is quite a common objection, right? I actually was recently reading a um, memoir by an Australian singer and actor. Um, It's a really beautiful memoir, but there was quite a sort of sad few paragraphs where she was talking about why she left her faith. And this is precisely what she said. She was like, I don't need a church to tell me what's right and wrong. I know what's right and wrong, right? I have a conscience and I just need to follow that. And so she left the church behind. But it was interesting because as I was reading the book, so many of the things that she said that she had done or experienced, I was thinking, well, you thought that that was right or good. I'm reading it thinking, I think that's wrong and <laughs> not good. Okay. So which of us is right? Like, how, how do you know that what your conscience is telling you is more correct than what my conscience would be telling me in that situation? And we see this in the world around us, right? Like we only have to pick any of the sort of big hot button topics of today and look at the kind of division that there is around the world in terms of, you know, what's right, what's the ethical, moral decision. Or we can look at, you know, the thousands upon thousands of Protestant denominations around the world that have been split along really important theological, ethical lines, right? So this is something that um, Peter Kraft talks about. He says... Suppose Christ had not established a single visible church with authority to teach in his name. Suppose he had left it up to us. Suppose we had to figure out the right doctrine of the Trinity, the two natures of Christ, the sacraments, Mary. Who then could ever know with certainty the mind and the will of God? So what this points us to is the fact that we need a church and not a church that is purely guided by human intellect and human consciences, right? Our own opinions on what we think is right or wrong, because that changes all the time and it changes from person to person. What we need is a church that is established and then guided by the God that it worships. Okay, so... That kind of what we call juridical element of the church, that's necessary. But, but that's not it. As we've already said, the church isn't just a set of rules and regulations. So the Catechism in point 771 refers to the church as the mystical body of Christ. So if you remember in the last episode, we talked about how Every person in the state of grace has the divine life of God flowing through them. Okay, so the image that Christ uses in the Bible is of a vine with its branches. So we can think about how a vine is one thing, right? It's one single complete organism. And the life of the vine flows through each of its branches. Okay, or another image that we could use since we're coming up to Christmas. Happy Advent, everyone is the image of fairy lights. You know those lights that we put up at Christmas? How the electricity flows through and switches on every one of those little bulbs. Okay, so when we say that we are the mystical body of Christ, we don't just mean like a kind of wishy-washy, like we're one big happy family and we all love each other a lot, or we've got one sort of joint mission. No, we literally mean that every member of the church has the same divine life flowing through them. And that connects us. That means that the church is what we call the mystical body of Christ. So there's this beautiful quote from St. Joan of Arc, where she says, Jesus Christ and the church are just one thing, and we shouldn't complicate the matter. <laughs> so that's so simply put, but but what a beautiful and striking image, right? That Christ and his church are so completely united. And this also calls to mind the image of the church as the bride of Christ, right? Because that's what our Lord says in the Gospels when he talks about husband and wife becoming one flesh. In the same way, we, the church and Christ, become one mystical body. Okay, so this idea that we're all the one body of Christ, okay, might seem a little bit sort of abstract and airy-fairy. Like, what does that actually mean? What does the church actually look like? So what are the characteristics of this one body of Christ? So in the creed, we say that the church is one, holy, 
Catholic and apostolic. So what do those four words mean? Okay, let's unpack each of them. So when we say that the church is one, what we mean is that it is united. So point 815 of the catechism tells us that we are united as a church by a a couple of things. First of all, we're united by one shared faith. Okay, we all share the same faith. Now, does that mean that every minute aspect of everything we do and think and believe is exactly the same? No, of course not. And we will go into that a little bit more in a second. What that means is that there are important definitional things that make my faith and our faith Roman Catholic, okay, rather than Protestant or Hindu or Muslim, okay. So we call these things, these important fundamental things, we call them dogmas, okay. So things like the infallibility of the Pope, the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, the fact that Mary was conceived without sin, okay. These are all aspects of the faith that all Catholics share, and in fact, that all Catholics have to share in order to be called Catholic. Okay. Now, that might sound a little bit harsh. Yeah. It might sound like we're being a little bit almost discriminatory or unfair to people who, you know, might not share all the same beliefs, but they still want to be Catholic and they still love the Catholic Church. Let's imagine that you and your friends are playing soccer together, and another friend comes along and says, Oh, hey, can I play with you? And you're like, Yeah, for sure, of course. And they say, Oh, great, thanks. Oh, by the way, do you mind if I pick up the ball with my hands when I'm running. And you say to them, oh, actually, that that's more like football. Um, we're playing soccer, which is something different. And they say, no, I know you're playing soccer, but I want to play soccer, but where I'm holding the ball. And you're like, okay, but that's not soccer. <laughs> that's football. So if you want to play football, there's actually a few guys over there playing football. You can definitely play with them. Like, go for it. You're, you're free to play football. Or if you want to play with us, that's totally fine, but we'd ask you not to run with the ball in your hands. Or third option, if you don't want to do either of those things, you just want to hang out with us, that's completely fine. Just wait until we finish this game and then we'll all go and get a pizza together, okay? And then you can totally come along. So that's not you being unfair and discriminatory, okay? Because what that person is describing isn't soccer, okay? It's something else. And that's fine. They have every right to play that other game, but they're not playing soccer. So it's kind of similar with the church, right? If someone comes along and says, hey, look, I really love the Catholic Church and I want to be included, but I don't think that the Pope is infallible and I don't think that it's really Jesus in the Eucharist. So what do I do? And you could say to them, all right, awesome. It sounds like what you're describing is more like Protestantism. Or if you want to join us, you're totally welcome to. Maybe you can spend some time thinking and studying and praying with the Catholic Church and trying to find answers to some of the questions that you have. Like, we've got plenty of material. We can help you out with the things that you don't understand or don't agree with. Or if you don't want to do either of those things, you're still welcome to hang out with us, right? We will find ways to include you. You can still participate in the life of the parish. You can come to the barbecue or the Bible study. You can even come to church. You just can't receive the sacraments. Okay. So it's not that you're not welcome. It's just that what you're describing isn't Catholicism. Now, as we already said, being united in one faith doesn't mean that we all have to look and behave in exactly the same way. Unity is not the same as uniformity. Point number 791 of the Catechism says that the body's unity does not do away with the diversity of its members. So within the church, there are what we call different charisms or gifts of the Holy Spirit. So think of an orchestra, right? So in an orchestra, you have, you know, some people playing the violin, some people playing the cellos, someone's on the trumpets and some people are on the flutes. And they're actually all playing different parts of the music. They're not all playing the melody, but together they're all playing the one piece of music. Now, imagine that this orchestra is playing like the overture to the marriage of Figaro and one of the instruments starts randomly doing like a jazz improvisation (laughs) right in the middle of things. Okay, it would probably ruin everything. But that doesn't mean that you have to have the exact same instruments playing the exact same notes at the exact same time. Like imagine an orchestra that was just made up entirely of oboes. (laughs) It would suck. So it's the same in the church. We have different religious orders, different rites and associations, but as long as we're all playing the same piece and no one's branching off into their own little improvisation, that's completely fine. In fact, it's necessary, right? We don't want to be a church of oboes. So another thing that unites the church along with this shared faith is the bond of charity. 
And another word for charity, of course, is love. So Colossians 3.14 tells us that charity binds everything together in perfect harmony. So charity is like the glue that keeps us all together. So what does that mean? Does that mean that we just have this vague feeling of love for one another? No, that is not what love is. It's like when I was talking about my friend who was just saying that she lives by the golden rule. I remember kind of pushing against that a little bit and being like, so what does that mean? Like to love your neighbor? And she was like, oh, you know, like you just love them. And I was like, okay, that's, that doesn't say anything. You haven't told me anything. (laughs) So We have to live our love for others in the church. We have to be united in love. So what that means is that I can't get around being like, yep, I'm a Catholic. I love the church. I love my faith. I love God. And then at the same time, I'm like talking crap about my parish priest behind his back with my friends, or I'm making fun of that nun who taught at my school, or I'm like complaining about, oh, I just can't stand that person from my youth group. Okay. Even... If the things I'm talking about are true, right, even if I have a good reason to be upset or disappointed or frustrated, and obviously in that situation, you know, I should take the steps to resolve any problem that I have with someone, but that's not the same as gossiping about it with our friends, or even worse, in a public setting. And it's exactly the same as you would treat a member of your family, you know, like if one of your siblings said something completely stupid or even wrong, you wouldn't go to all of your friends and be like, oh my gosh, can you believe what my sister said? Honestly, I am so sick of her saying these stupid things. Okay, you wouldn't do that because you love your siblings. Okay, now I know we've spent a while on this idea of unity, but that's because it is really, really important. Unity isn't just something nice that we we should have or we should strive for as Catholics. The Catholic Encyclopedia talks about how unity is one of the marks of the church. One of the unmistakable signs and distinctive characteristics which render the church recognisable. So this is serious stuff. As we read in the Gospels, you know, they'll know that we're Christians by our love. So we need to be united in charity. Otherwise, we run the risk of sort of seriously marring the face of our own faith. Okay, so the church is one. It is also holy. So what does it mean to say that the church is holy? Point number 823 of the Catechism reads, The church is unfailingly holy because Christ joined the church to himself as his body and endowed her with the gift of the Holy Spirit. So what does this mean? This means that the church is holy because God is holy, not because we are, okay? It doesn't mean that every member of the Catholic Church is a perfect saint. So if we return to that image of like fairy lights, right, we think about how the current of electricity flows through the whole string of lights, okay? But the degree to which it lights each of them up depends on how well each of them is allowing the current to flow through it. Some of them might be dimmer than others, and some of them might have gone out altogether. They might be completely disconnected. But no matter what's happening with the individual light bulbs, the current itself remains strong, okay, remains flowing through that wire. And it's the same with us, right? Like, Christ is holy, and he has imbued his church with his divine life. So what makes the church holy isn't the degree to which I'm cooperating with God's grace. What makes the church holy is God. And this can be really helpful to us when it comes to those moments in the history of the church or even at the moment, you know, when we look around us and we see things that might upset us or scandalize us or hurt us. And we think like, how can this church be holy? You know, how can it be from God? And how can I be part of something so broken? And of course, you know, if we're all part of the one body, then when someone does something wrong, it hurts all of us. And that's okay. We should feel that. But at the same time, we need to remember the church isn't a club that I join because, you know, I like all of its members or I think that they're all perfect saints, right? Of course, there are many, many saints in the church. And that's one of the reasons why the church canonizes people to remind us of what is possible. At the same time, so there's this saying that has been attributed to St. Augustine, although to be honest, I can't find where he actually said it. I think it might be one of those false attributions. But anyway, it's still a good saying. It's that the church isn't a hotel for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. Okay, I'm not part of the Catholic Church because its members are all perfect. 
I'm part of the church because Christ is perfect. And when I unite myself to him, I get to participate in his divine life. And if I allow it to flow through me unimpeded, then I can shine as brightly as all of the other great saints. Okay, so the catechism also tells us that the church is Catholic. Now here we're talking about the word Catholic with a lowercase c. So point number 830 of the catechism says that the word Catholic means universal. So what this means is that everyone in the whole world, no matter who they are or where they're from, everyone is called to be part of that one mystical body of Christ. So point number 831 says, the church has been sent out by Christ on a mission to the whole of the human race. It makes me think of um the Blues Brothers. We're on a mission from God. We really are. Now, this might sound a little bit problematic to some people. Okay, This idea that everyone in the whole world is called to be a Catholic. Because at times in history, the spread of Christianity has unfortunately been associated with and sort of caught up in colonialism, right? It's really important here to return to the idea of diversity and the difference between unity and uniformity. Spreading Catholicism, people don't need to sacrifice their own cultures or conform to a specifically Anglo-Saxon form of Christianity. The fundamental truths of the Catholic Church are universal, right? And they can be applied anywhere. But the ways that they are expressed in different cultures can vary. So this was one of the things that Vatican II did. There was a change that allowed people to say the Mass in their local language rather than just in Latin, right? So my grandmother grew up in South America and she absolutely loves this piece of music called La Misa Criolla, which is, it's the Mass. It's the parts of the Mass, the sung parts of the Mass, the Kyrie and the Gloria and the Sanctus, etc. But it's all written in Spanish and it was composed using Argentinian instruments and rhythms. It also happens to be one of the most beautiful pieces of music like on the planet. So everyone should listen to it and pray with it. It's so beautiful. But it's so distinctly Argentinian. It's so South American. And that's what, such a beautiful example of how that expression of the same things can look and sound different. Okay. And then the second issue, this idea that evangelization means like bulldozing other religions. That is not what that means at all. So I love this story of Pope St. John Paul II, who apparently had this really, really close friend from childhood that he had all through his life, who was Jewish, right? And Pope John Paul II never converted him. He never tried to convert him. He completely respected his faith. So as Catholics, we are called to balance two realities. On the one hand, other faiths, they all have aspects and elements of the truth, right? Even if they don't have the fullness of the truth. And we need to respect that and honor that and meet people exactly where they're at. At the same time, we do, we're do we not relativists, right? As Catholics, we really do believe that we have the fullness of truth and we want to share that with other people. In fact, we have an obligation to try to share that with other people. But again, on the flip side, that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to like actively, explicitly try to convert our friends to Catholicism. Some people we do. Some people, that's where they're at and they're ready for that. Many, many other people... It's going to be a lot more subtle. It's going to be a matter of meeting people where they're at, listening to them, understanding their faith, finding those points of common ground, and then helping our friends to draw closer to God without ever kind of manipulating or pushing or forcing or undermining what they already have. Okay, so lastly, the Catechism tells us in point number 857 that the church is apostolic. So what that means is that the church was built on the foundation of the apostles. Okay, Christ established his church through the apostles. The apostles then passed on the same faith that they received, and they also passed on the authority that they had received to their successors. And that same faith has been preserved and passed on and continues to be and will be via the magisterium, which is made up of the bishops. And actually, I've probably mentioned this before, but one thing that it's always really worth doing if you want to look at how well the faith has been preserved from you know the earliest years of Christianity is to read the writings of the early fathers of the church. It's pretty astonishing, actually, like how similar the early church was to the church as it looks now, especially, I mean, certainly in its fundamentals, right? Okay, so 
in the next episode, we're going to keep talking about this stuff, okay? The bishops, the hierarchy of the church, and then the role of the laity within the church as well. To be continued in the next episode. I can't wait. Happy Advent, and I will see you soon. Bye.